and welcome back everybody. Another exciting video here in our Audio Tube Amplifier 101 series. Uh, this is episode 6 and we're going to focus today on AC theory and varying waveforms. Um, just a little precursor, um, to teach you AC or alternating current theory is a fairly difficult thing without some graphical representation. and. Um, I'm not an expert at creating computer animated graphics, so I'm going to leverage some work from other people on YouTube and other places to kind of give you the the gist of it. But I highly recommend you to kind of follow um, along to other YouTube videos. Just type in alternating current, hit enter, and uh, or AC theory, and um, watch some other videos. My goal here is not to be the expert on teaching you the in-depth uh, theory behind all this stuff. My goal is to give you enough info for you to be able to go search around and read some more, watch other videos, um, and then come back to this video. My goal really is to teach you how to apply this stuff to a um, you know an audio tube amplifier. So uh, trying to make it a pragmatic series, uh, real practical on how to uh, how to apply these theories in an audio tube amplifier. So. Today I'm going to teach you a little bit about AC theory, a little bit about varying waveforms, and how you know how they apply to a uh, tube amplifier. So hopefully it'll be a good uh, good series for you. Let's dive on in. Okay, one little topic I need to bring up because if you go out and you watch other videos out on the internet, some of them will use what is called electron flow instead of what I would call um, conventional um, current flow. So this is a theory in electrical engineering where basically um, the, the physicist would tell you that the electrons actually leave the the negative part of the battery uh, or energy source and flow to the positive part of the energy source is what physicists would tell you. And uh, believe it or not, they are the correct ones. Um, however, electrical engineers, uh, are being real practical, um, all along the way have denoted that current flows from kind of the positive around to the negative, which is what most people would kind of better understand. Um, so all the devices that have been made, whether it's a diode, a battery, um, you know, whatever components these days, um, they've all been made to follow this thing called conventional flow, which is how we denote current flow. So it's from positive to negative. Just sometimes you'll watch some older videos out there, if, and if they were made by physics in, in a physics class versus being an electrical class, they may actually show electrons flowing the opposite direction, which is, which is actually true. The electrons flow one way. Uh, but the holes that they leave behind uh, kind of flow the opposite direction, uh, creating a current opposite to the electron flow, and that current is what we actually leverage and measure and use in electronics. Okay, real simple concept here. This being the positive terminal of the battery and this being the negative, we would believe that current flows from the positive to the negative, thus in this direction. That's what we've got going on here in circuit one. Okay, but in circuit two here, we've turned the battery around backwards, right? The positive is here and the negative is here. That's yeah, a pretty simple concept. You could grasp the current is flowing in this direction, thus this direction. So we've basically altered the current direction by changing the direction of the battery, right? we reverse the energy source here. Okay, so then well, what if we could create an energy source that constantly went from one direction to the other and back and forth? In other words, you change the battery from positive to negative to negative to positive. And we did that in a somewhat consistent manner. Um, we could then generate an AC alternating current signal. And this is exactly what uh, Nikola Tesla did way back in the day. Okay, in order to show you how one might go about creating an energy source that constantly goes from positive to negative and creates an alternating current, I thought I might leverage this old Army public domain video that they use. And uh, pretty good stuff here. 
basic to the understanding of DC motors and generators, is the simple generation of an electromotive force, an EMF. Mechanical energy, the moving of a wire or conductor across a magnetic field by hand in this instance, produces electrical energy. The magnetic field is composed of lines of force. As the conductor cuts these lines, an electromotive force, or EMF, is generated in the conductor. Moving the conductor down through the field makes the needle of a voltmeter deflect one way, which means the EMF has one direction. Moving the conductor up through the field produces the opposite deflection of the needle. The EMF has now changed direction. Moving the conductor back and forth with the field does not make the needle of the voltmeter deflect. There is no EMF because the conductor is not cutting the field. To illustrate the direction of current flow, the conventional symbols will be used. Current flowing in a conductor away from us is represented by a cross, toward us by a dot. However, moving a conductor in and out of the field in this straight reciprocal fashion is awkward and impractical. A simple generator of EMF can also be made by rotating a single turn coil within a stationary magnetic field of two magnets with opposite polarity. The loop now, in effect, becomes two conductors because both the top and bottom sections cut magnetic lines during rotation. Since they cut lines of force of opposite directions as they rotate, EMFs of opposite polarity will be generated in the conductors. In order to have current flow in this circuit, polarities of the two conductors must be opposite. All right, here's where the fun's going to begin. So this is basically a graphical representation of an oscilloscope screen. And uh, an oscilloscope is just an electronic device that we will use all the time. And what it does is it basically measures on two different domains or axes. Um, one is volts. Um, so you can see here it goes from 0 volts up to, looks like, 2 volts here. And it goes from 0 volts all the way down to, looks like, minus 2 volts down here. And on the other axis or domain, um, we're measuring time, in this case milliseconds. And if you'll notice, it goes from 0 milliseconds all the way up through 100 milliseconds here, with this center piece being 50 milliseconds, uh, the same as this center here being 0. So we're kind of going from 0 to minus 2, 0 to um, positive 2 here, and on the time domain, 0 here to 100 milliseconds, okay? All right, let's talk about measuring um, kind of an AC signal, right? So when a signal is at this point, it is basically at zero volts, right? And as the signal goes up and reaches its absolute maximum peak right here, which looks to be at about 0.7 volts, right? You can kind of draw the line across over here and count the ticks. Um, that is what is known as the amplitude, as you can see here, from here to here, or also the peak voltage. Okay, Another concept to learn it would be that uh, if you go all the way from the peak but don't go down to zero but go to the, the other peak which would be below zero here, um, you would actually be going from 0.7 positive here all the way down to minus 0.7 and if you did the math on that you would notice that the peak voltage then is equal to 1.4 volts from here, from this point, all the way down to this point. Okay, one other thing you may see when you're working with a voltmeter is something called RMS voltage, RMS, otherwise known as re root mean square voltage. Um, so sometimes you, you go to buy a meter, like a good flute meter, and it'll say it is a true RMS reading meter. Let me tell you where that comes important. So. For a true sine wave like this that has this nice repeating characteristics, um, if you did the physics on it, you would actually go measure the surface area underneath of this peak right here. And um, you'd do some calculations around that, and it would come out and give you this RMS voltage right here. 
But since this is a good clean sine wave, so anytime you've got a nice sine wave, RMS is equal to 0 0.707 times your peak voltage, okay? And in this case, you know, our peak voltage here was 0 0.7 times 0 0.707. So our RMS voltage would be somewhere around a half a volt here, um, would be what that would measure. The reason that we work with, um, you know, RMS voltages from time to time is it's really easy to figure out when you've got a, um, a nice sinusoidal um, pattern here. But what if this was a square wave or you know, trapezoid shaped? What if it wasn't perfectly uh, symmetrical like this? Then there's a much longer formula you would have to use to figure out RMS voltages. But sometimes RMS voltages get used when you're building power supplies, and that's why I wanted to point this out too. Okay, well, let's shift away from the uh, voltage domain over here that we've been measuring against, and let's start talking about some stuff measured here on the time domain. Um, so if you picked any two points on this, uh, this uh, sine wave, like the bottoms of the troughs here, and you measured from here to here, um, it would be the same as measuring from here to here because it's symmetrical, and we would call that one cycle. And in this case, we go from 50 milliseconds to 80 milliseconds, so one cycle is 30 milliseconds. Well, if we had came up here and measured from this peak to this peak, or this peak to this peak, it would be the exact same 30 milliseconds between all of these measurements. Um, we could have also came along here and said, hey, how about the downward slope here of this thing where it crosses the zero axis, and when does that repeat again in this signal? It happens again right here. Well, if you measured from here to here, it would be the same 30 milliseconds. So basically this thing is repeating itself and all characteristics about it every 30 milliseconds. Well that 30 milliseconds is what we call the period, um, time period, of this of this sinusoidal wave. Well a uh, really interesting formula. Um, in electronics we don't work with period or time a whole lot. What we work with um, is this thing called frequency. In other words, how many times does this thing repeat in a given second is the, uh, is the way we typically look at it. And so this thing, the way we come to that, frequency is equal to 1 over basically the period here or time, which in this case would be 1 over 0 0.030 because it's 30, remember milliseconds, we move three times to the left. It comes out to be about 30, oops, sorry, 33 HZ, otherwise known as Hertz, or Hertz are also known as times per second. So this thing is repeating itself 33 times per second, if that makes sense. Okay, just a couple of real practical examples for you here. This is another uh, nice little sine wave that we have going on and it has a hundred and seventy volt watt right here to here would be its peak voltage right hundred and seventy volts peak right um, peak to peak here would be whoa twice that um, another thing to note about this is that it uh, you know from uh, zero milliseconds it takes sixteen point six seven milliseconds to make a cycle so Let's figure out a couple things here on this and uh, see what see what comes up really quickly. Um, if you'll notice here, this 170 volt peak times what did I tell you for a true sine wave? How to figure out RMS voltage? You would say 0 0.707, right? Guess what? 120 volts. So uh, that's kind of starting to blow your mind here. So we've got 120 volts. Um, RMS. Well, guess what? That is how we measure power out of our wall uh, outlets in our home is in RMS voltages. So if you ever stuck a true 
um, peak reading meter into a uh, wall outlet, you would measure something closer to 170 volts. If you turn the settings on it to read in RMS, you would see that it's about 120 volts coming out of this thing. So we could go over here and fill in this question mark with 120 volts RMS. Well, what about this uh, cycles here? Uh, what's the frequency of this uh, signal happening right now? Okay, so if we want to figure out the frequency of this thing, remember it was uh, 1 over the, uh, whoops, it's 1 over time here, which is going to be in this case 16.67 uh, milliseconds or 0 0.01667 equals to, what's the calculator on that say? 1 divided by 0 0.01667 equals to 59.98, otherwise known here in this case as um, 60 hertz is our frequency of the signal. So what we're representing here is a typical wall outlet um, sine wave at this point in time. Okay, what we've got here is we've uh, came out of an iPhone straight into an audio amplifier, and I'm measuring the output of that amplifier on an oscilloscope, as you can see here. And what I want you to be aware of is that um, you know your audio signals in a typical song are not sine waves, they're not square waves, they're not these beautifully symmetrical things. As you can see here, both the amplitude is changing all the time here, as well as the frequency, how often these things are uh, repeating themselves. Um, going on constantly. So that's kind of the name of the game with uh, audio amplifiers. You've got to build something that can respond to these changes in amplification all the time and changes in frequency. And uh, we'll explain a little bit more about this uh, audio frequency as we go on now. Okay, if you'll remember frequency we defined as the number of times something varies per second. And if we look at this uh, this whole graph here, it's kind of plotting frequency here in hertz, as we talked about, which is measured times per second, all the way down here from basically zero, all the way up here to 10 to the 21th power, which is a huge number. Um, so there's things up here varying gazillion, I'll use that word, times per second, more than, uh, more than I could count. But let's talk a little bit about the spectrum of uh, frequency here. So um, it's very interesting that you actually have on the very bottom of the spectrum, basically from 20 times a second to around 10,000 times a second, maybe 15 or 20,000 times a second for people whose ears can hear really well. Um, that's where our audio spectrum is. You know, as you kind of move up the spectrum from 600,000 times a second to 1.6 million times a second varying, that's kind of where our AM radio spectrum is at. Uh, you know, you get up here in the 20 megahertz, that's where an ultrasound takes place. 88 million times a second to 108 million times a second, that's your FM radio band. So if you tune to uh, 103.7 or something, it's 103.7 million times that frequency is varying per second. Kind of your TV broadcast band, you hear your wireless unit, maybe a 2.4 gigahertz unit, it's 2.4, not million, but million million times per second. You can see your, oper your microwave operates down here. By the way, if you'll notice your microwave and your uh, wireless data operate at the same frequency, which is not always great in your household. You get into radio as you go on up here, you get into imaging, uh, remote controls, night vision, you know, getting a sun. This is actually the spectrum of the sun, kind of from here to here. Then you kind of get into x-rays, what's going on when you go get an x-ray or you get your luggage screened at the uh, TSA at the airport. Or maybe you go get a CAT scan or a PET scan, something along those lines. You're getting way up here into some super, super high frequencies. Um, but for audio amplifiers and what we're all about, we're way down here on this very end of the spectrum. So I want to give you that point of reference. All right, what we've got here is a blow up of that audio spectrum we were looking at just a minute ago in the very bottom left hand corner of the previous picture. And if you'll notice here, it kind of goes from around 20 times a second up to about 20,000 times a second. That's kind of what is considered the audio spectrum. Anything below 20 times a second, you really can't hear, you just feel it. 
it's almost like a vibration or uh, somebody shaking you or something. Uh, which, you know, and the spectrum here kind of goes all the way down to zero hertz or no times a second. Um, so what we're kind of concerned with in the audio spectrum, you know, is this this range right here. And that range then is broken down into some sections. So um, right here, kind of your bass frequency, you know, your drums, your bass guitar, all that happens from about 20 hertz to, uh, you know, maybe 150 hertz or so. If you'll notice, everything below that is called subsonic. In other words, below what you can hear. And the word sonic kind of represents uh, what you can hear. And you kind of get up here into your upper bass. Um, you know, this this area right here, from here to here, is kind of what your mid-range speaker would produce. This is kind of what your woofer would produce. This this area in here is where your vocals play out or your guitar strings uh, play out. Um, so. It's a very important section of the frequency spectrum. And then you get up into this section, and you really get into where your tweeter is and your speaker is what it's producing. Um, you know, maybe something produced by a cymbal or, um, you know, maybe a flute or something extremely high end. A dog whistle would be way up here into this end of the spectrum, if that makes sense. And, um, you know, some people's hearing stops off around 10 kilohertz. In other words, they just don't hear things higher than that. Some people's may go all the way up here to 20,000 hertz, you know, 20 kilohertz. A lot of it has to do with age. The older you get, the, uh, you know, kind of the more your hearing uh, um, deteriorates and you're unable to hear frequencies as high as you could when you were younger. And, you know, I've been to a lot of rock concerts over time, so maybe this is about where I can actually hear. I'm not sure. Um, I think I'm actually probably up around in this range because uh, I have been able to hear things higher than 10 kilohertz recently. But, um, you know, if you think about this spectrum and an audio amplifier, um, whether you're building one, working on one, repairing one, or whatever, the goal here is really to be able to amplify from one end of the spectrum to the other consistently. In other words, equally across the spectrum. Well, that's the goal of the amplifier, but sometimes you'll have people that like, you know, maybe their hearing is deteriorating a little bit and they can't hear this section as well as they used to. So they would actually like to boost that end of the spectrum, maybe a little bit like this. Well, guess what? When you grab the treble knob on your um, receiver or um, on your stereo setting or whatever, and you turn the treble up, that's what you're doing. You're telling it to amplify more on this end of the spectrum and maybe keep the rest of the spectrum flat. Um, if you'll remember, you know, if you grab the bass knob, well, then what you're doing is you're kind of uh, amplifying this end. Um, you know, like that. Some people might like to turn up the bass and the treble. <laughs> And uh, you end up with a smiley face. And uh, if you remember back in the 70s and 80s, equalizers were uh, popular things. And you had these this long row of uh, kind of little settings. And people, that's what you actually were doing. You were adjusting these settings to say, hey, this is the, uh, the uh, amplification pattern I want to uh, do. Maybe I want to amplify this section more and maybe hmm, maybe something right in here and all the way down here and you could kind of do that with uh, one of those little uh, you know um, equalizers not as popular these days um, pure audio files have gotten back to being really purest a matter of fact a lot of them believe if you're amplifying anything unproportionately you're uh, changing the way that it was originally generated thus you're messing with the audio and it's not pure anymore so uh, this would be the audio file approved uh, you know, amplification, and this would not be, if that makes sense. Uh, let's, uh, let's dive on into a few more things. Okay, let's bring this video home and uh, wrap it up here with a, looking at the uh, Scott 222C uh, integrated amplifier schematic. Now let's talk a little bit about both frequencies and amplitudes of things coming in here. Well, right here you can see this is uh, 50 to 60 hertz is what this little symbol is saying right here at somewhere around 105 to 125 volts. In other words, 120 volt wall outlet. So you're picking up uh, 120 volts amplitude and 60 hertz or 60 times a second. You're coming into the power supply here. What you're doing in this transformer is you're actually amplifying, um, raising the amplitude of that signal up into the, uh, let's look, um, 420 
volts of amplitude, 330 volts, 285. So we're creating different voltages of amplitude to send throughout the, uh, the amplifier. And the other thing we're doing here with uh, some of these parts and components is we're converting AC signal into DC, um, if that makes sense. Okay, and then way over here on the input, we've got um, a mag pickup, which is basically your phono input. Well, phono signals are somewhere around the, t typically around uh, 5 millivolts is the amplitude of that signal. And the audio being produced could be anywhere from what we showed before, maybe 10 hertz, all the way up to 20,000 kilohertz getting fed into here. So this stage of the, uh, the unit is... Um, is the phono section and it has to be able to amplify five millivolts up to around um, 0.5 volts or in other words 500 millivolts so this section here has to be able to do amplification somewhere around 100 times um, but it doesn't change the frequency it's just changing the amplitude and what it's doing here um, this thing's got to be very you know, be able to cover that full range, uh, 10 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz, if it's going to accurately represent what's being put into here into the next section of the amplifier. Well, if you didn't feed in via the phono and you came over here and fed in via the tuner or the tape input or the aux input, any of these other inputs, basically what you're doing is you're bypassing this entire first section and you're just feeding straight over here kind of not using this part to the left at all. So by the time you get here, well, guess what? You're at 500 millivolts or so, um, which would be kind of line level input. So um, the signal coming in here is already uh, 100 times stronger than what it would be if it was right here. Thus, you didn't need this amplification stage. But at this point, then we start going into other phases of the amplifier. Um, that either amplify it, change the signal, so um, split it so that it can be amplified by two different tubes here in the output, uh, things of that nature. But there's also some things along the way here, the loudness control, which lets you vary the amount of amplification being pro provided. There's also something here, look at that, that's that treble pot right there that you're varying. That tells it to amplify the treble end of the spectrum a little more than the other end of the spectrum. Look right here, that potentiometer um, right there, that is what controls the bass. So it tells it to either amplify um, the bass end of the spectrum more or less, either way. Um, and then what gets fed into the final output amplifier here is, is a similar signal. You don't really do a lot of amplification here in this middle stage. It's more about getting the signal um, ready for the final output, maybe by splitting it here in the phase splitter stage or maybe by um, letting you amplify the bass a little bit or the treble a little bit more right here or vary the loudness. So this is really the preamp stage here in the middle of this amplifier. It's kind of phono. This is kind of preamp. This is kind of the phase splitter. And then this here is finally the output um, amplifier. So sometimes they call that the final amplifier because it is the final amplifier as the signal makes its way through this thing over here. One other thing to note here is pretty neat. Let's say you plug your headphones in. Well, guess what? You're plugging your headphones in basically right here. In other words, after the preamp, so you've adjusted the tone, the volume, the bass, whatever, but before the final amplifier. So if you've ever got an amplifier where maybe the, uh, the phono's working, you can hear fine through the headphones, but you don't get something out through the speakers, well, you've just isolated your whole problem to this very last part of the amplifier. So hopefully this is starting to make a little bit of sense to you. Um, really, you know, all the way through this thing, from this end to the other, the audio signal, remember, 10 hertz to 20,000 hertz, 20 kilohertz. And then really right here in the middle of this thing, and boy, I'm getting an ugly drawing going on here, that's uh, your power supply, and you're dealing with uh, 60 hertz in this area here. Hope you've learned something today. If not, I um, <laughs> don't know what to tell you, but uh, keep watching. Maybe you will. Thanks, everybody, and uh, keep watching these things. We will keep making them, uh, having a lot of fun making them, and uh, enjoy getting the feedback from you. 
and we'll see what's in the uh in the next series coming up soon thanks everybody